Welcome back to another episode of Psycho Cinematic. Today we are covering the movie The Lobster, co-written and directed by Yorgos Lanthimos. And as always, spoilers ahead. Now, before we get into this film, it's funny because Yorgos Lanthimos also co-wrote and directed The Killing of a Sacred Deer, which I watched maybe three years ago, and I hated it. I couldn't even make it all the way through. I made like an hour and a half, and I just gave up on it because me and my wife just didn't like it. But it's funny because I think that I could probably appreciate it now and I probably wouldn't think it's that bad. These types of films are actually starting to grow on me a lot and my mindset has changed. But what I'm realizing is that as long as I know going into the film that it's not going to be a traditional film, then I'm okay. But it's when I go in expecting, oh, this is gonna be a thriller, this is gonna be a horror movie, and then it's just all fever dream symbolism, nothing really makes that much sense in reality, that's when I get bummed out. So when I know it's going to be like that ahead of time, it's great. So this film opens up with a woman going to shoot a donkey, and I feel like it's no coincidence that this woman looks pretty similar to the heartless woman, even though I know it's not the same person. This felt like subliminal messaging for me to infer what happens after the credits roll. Allow me to explain. Later in this film, when David is dating the heartless woman and then she starts to catch on to the fact that he doesn't actually love her, she says how she's going to turn him into the staff and then they're going to turn him into the animal that essentially all the liars get turned into and he's like what animal is that and she says it's the animal that no one wants to be and I think that is a jackass. No one wants to be a jackass, so a donkey. Now yes, David did tranquilize the heartless woman and he even went as far as to put her into that transformation room, but I do not assume for a second that David nor anyone at this hotel that's not a staff member knows how to use the technology that lies beyond the door. So my theory is that he put her in there and then the staff later found her and just returned her to her room. So then fast forward to the end of the film when David was living with the loners and then he and the short-sighted woman just escaped the loners and now they're at the diner and David is going to blind himself to strengthen their bond together. And while this film doesn't confirm whether or not David does successfully follow through with blinding himself, I believe that he does blind himself. But now that they're both blind, they can't flee, hide, or escape if someone tries to catch them. Whether that is the police trying to enforce the relationship rules, the staff from the hotel trying to get him back to the hotel, or the loners who probably want to exact the revenge on them. So I believe that they were caught shortly after that and David was returned to the hotel, turned into the jackass, and then once the heartless woman caught wind of that, went and hunted him down. Now that we got that out of the way, here are some things that stuck out to me in this film. So the film addresses that David is at that hotel after his 11 year relationship fails. And a part of me feels like he was cheated on and that's why his wife or girlfriend, I can't remember if they specify that or not, isn't there with him. Cause I could see them breaking up and then they both have to go to a hotel. I would imagine they probably wouldn't put them at the same hotel. But that idea that you could cheat on the person that you're in a relationship with in the real world and you don't get sent to a hotel, but the other person and does when you decide to go with the person that you're having an affair with, that's fucked up. So it's funny because I made a short video of this for Instagram and it went viral and it's been an interesting case study of how people react to this idea that you have to be at this hotel for 45 days, if you can't find a match and you get turned into an animal. A ton of people are like, fuck that, just turn me into a lion or whatever animal right away. Which I think just goes to show you how jaded some single people are or how rebellious some people in a relationship are that they're like, no, I'm not gonna play by these rules, just turn me into an animal, fuck being a human. Now I will say the weirdest animal that anyone has said that they wanted to turn into was a worm. I'll give you three good reasons why you shouldn't become a worm. One, the lack of daylight. Two, birds. And then three, fishing. Do you really want to be impaled on a hook and then cast into a lake as food for a fish? But what's probably more common than that is that you'll just continuously be impaled on this hook and then reeled in, you know, just dragging your guts for like a dad teaching their kid how to fish and then eventually on one of the real ends you'll just find yourself unimpaled by the hook and then you'll just drown in the water don't be a worm now with that being said i think i would either choose to be an eagle or a golden retriever more specifically a bald eagle in hopefully the united states because i believe they are protected from you know hunting and i don't think they have a ton of predators so that would be pretty sweet fly around jack fish or rabbits or whatever and 
eat them and just live your best life really. And then yes, golden retriever. I know they say in the film that that's the reason there's so many dogs and not a lot of other animals out there because people choose dog. But I think a golden retriever would most closely match my personality. But you then run the risk of being put with pet owners who are absolutely awful. So probably the eagle. Yeah. When David is put into his hotel room, they put like a lock on his belt and tie his arm behind his back. And they're saying this is just to show you how much easier it is to do life with two things. I think it's also pretty clear that it's like an anti-masturbation, you know, exercise, like your right arm's tied behind your back and your belt is stuck to your arm. So it's pretty hard to get your pants off in general. And I love this, he's staying in room 101. And I immediately wrote down, this seems like symbolism for 101 Dalmatians. Cruella DeVille wanted the Dalmatians for their fur, so essentially their skin. And he is quite literally going to be reskinned to become an animal. So 101 Dalmatians. Later in this film, David talks to the nosebleed girl and she explains to him how to properly get blood stains out of your clothing. And I was so bummed that this wasn't foreshadowing for later in this film when he confronted the limping man and the nosebleed girl on the yacht. And he was saying how, you know, that's probably not even real blood on his shirt. I was hoping that he was going to say, yeah, uh, ask him to wash it off. And then if it wasn't real blood, then she might be able to tell just by the way that it's leaving a stain or not, or how easily it's coming off, she would know. But unfortunately that didn't happen. Now, when they have to go and hunt the single people, this seems like it plays on just the imagery of what it's like when you're single and you're trying to find your mate. It feels like a hunt and it is competitive out there. And you've got some people who want to try and hunt as many people as they can, and then others would just be happy if they could just find one. That dry humping therapy where the maid has to kind of like grind on David is so painfully awkward to watch. And it's just the most manipulative thing that you could do to a man. You get him horny, therefore more active in this whole process. It's pretty messed up. And David's friend gets in trouble for masturbating, so they put his hand in the toaster as punishment, which not only is that just torturous and awful, but now you have to have your hand bandaged up so everyone at this hotel knows what you did. How much harder is it to find a mate when you have a bandaged up hand from we all know what you did? So the man with the limp was hoping for another person to come in with a limp, and then that doesn't happen. So he fakes the bloody nose, therefore being a liar, but the film treats all of these shortcomings almost like types. So we've got the limp, the bloody nose, the short-sightedness. If you have one of these things, it's almost equivalent to saying like, yeah, my type is blonde hair and blue eyes and Australian. And you need to fit into that box for us to even entertain whether or not we'll be a good match. I believe it's the hotel manager who says, once you reach an argument that you can't settle amongst yourselves, we'll assign you a kid because that helps a lot. <laughs> it's obvious commentary because, you know, for some people, they have a kid to attempt to solve their problems, which is probably not a good play, which also leads to the hysterical moment. I actually laughed out loud when David kicks the nosebleed woman and the limping man's kid in the shin because it seems frowned upon to have a kid. That means that you guys already had an argument that you couldn't solve amongst yourselves. That part was hilarious. <laughs> I love that throughout this film that there's just random creatures in the forest, which leads me to believe that as soon as you get turned into that animal that you chose, they're not going to go and put you where you need to go. They just set you free right then and there. So we got a camel, a peacock, a pony. I am curious though, like, so if you said you wanted to be a shark, like a lot of people on my Instagram did, are they going to take you to the ocean <laughs> or are they just going to be like, all right, there you go. And you just flop around on the surface and die. After David escapes a hotel and then finds the loners, he bonds with the short-sighted woman, which feels symbolic for two things. One, short-sighted, they're not going to have their eyesight that much longer. And then two, I believe he does follow through and blind himself for love. And in the end, he just gets caught immediately, is what I believe. And so that was like short-sightedness. You're looking to strengthen this bond now, but you're not thinking about the longevity of like, all right, well, how do we make sure that this actually lasts and we don't get apprehended? It's hysterical to me because they can communicate with those crazy gestures and they have their own language basically. And that is way 
stronger of a bond in my opinion than you know like the short-sightedness but it just plays into the comical nature of what they're doing in this film the last piece of symbolism that i picked up on was when they're in the diner before david decides to go and take his eyesight away there is a ton of construction going on in the background and i feel like that is symbolic for them building, constructing their new relationship and their new life together. But in reality, I'm guessing that the film location just had a lot of construction going on in the background. They're like, ah, oh, we'll just roll with it. Who knows? Now for the joke more of the story. This film is what happens when you cross a psychological film with Friends the TV show. If you recall when Phoebe says that Rachel is Ross's lobster because apparently lobsters only have one mate in their life and they stick with them the whole time. When I was reminded of this by my wife, I was kind of bummed because we got this real high brow movie and then some low brow comedy. I don't know where we find ourselves after that. So I'm gonna give this movie an 8.5 out of 10. I love the crazy concept and I love seeing this black mirror-like world of dystopian relationships. I love that the ending was perfectly open-ended that I could build my own theory of what I thought happened next. Really the only thing I didn't like about this film was I felt like after David escaped the hotel, my excitement and intrigue decreased quite a bit and since it has about a two hour runtime i felt like it went on a little bit long and i started getting kind of bored if it was a little bit shorter then i think that that probably would have boosted it to about a nine or a nine and a half but as far as the remainder to get to that 10 out of 10 i can't really put my finger on it other than when i watch a 10 out of 10 movie I know it because I can't hide my excitement nor stop talking about it. And that's all I have for you guys today on the movie The Lobster. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the podcast. If you did, leave me a thumbs up, comment what you thought down below, and then don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one.